All right, so this is going to be the long-awaited Mozart class, provided my voice will hold out. <clears throat> a few weeks ago, or maybe it was a month ago, maybe even a little more than that, Lynn gave an address to a LIM conference in Berlin. And one of the things he said is, a string quartet is a chorus. It's a singing chorus. The string performer in a quartet is actually singing in the mind and is able to cause the strings to sing in resonance with the mind. And therefore, as in the chorus, where you slightly flatten or sharpen in order to fit the modality that is required by the composition, that's how you perform. And he said the unity of effect in a string quartet was caused by these adjustments in modality. You hear that if you sing the notes as what you think is on pitch, and you go, you're going to miss it. Now, I want to develop a couple of points here. Some of you are familiar with these. Some of you have heard aspects of this before. But I want you to roll up your sleeves and do some work with me, because what we're going to take a look at is what, the, what Vu was saying at the end. What's the problem? Does anybody think Dick Cheney knows what he's doing with the economy? Does anybody think Bush has a clue? Now, what about the Democrats? Do they know? There's nobody in a position of leadership who knows what to do right now. Nobody. And we're headed toward war, and we're headed toward the biggest blowout of the world economy in history. And most people seem more concerned with what's happening with the Olympics or on American Idol than they are with what their future is going to be. That's not a problem of Bush. Bush is who he is. He's a moron. He's never been more than that. He's someone who's been put there. The question is, what does it say to a nation that tolerates that? And the question is, we have a nation that cannot think. The baby boomer generation turned off their brains quite a while ago. The youth have been miseducated. That most of the young people in this country have gotten an education which is not worthy of the name education. Maximum, you can find things on Google. And a lot of what you find, you know, Google's great. It gives you very rapid access to horseshit. <laughs> and as much of it as you want. <laughs> so how do we know something? Now what I want to take a look at is something that actually is associated with one person who's part of a series of individuals, of creative thinkers, who collectively are responsible for the development of modern society. These are a small group of people whose names you mostly know. Johann Sebastian Bach, Joseph Haydn, his collaborator and friend, Wolfgang Mozart. Now, one of the things that, that I, I'm going to say this right at the beginning, so if I really offend someone, let's get it out right at the beginning. <laughs> Your music, that is contemporary music, whether it's rap, country western, heavy metal, indie, uh, whatever it is, klezmer, your music today is pure, unadulterated crap designed to make you stupid and psychosexually impotent. Fifty years from now, no one will know Iron Maiden or 50 Cent. I can probably name some people who you've already forgotten. <laughs> But I assure you, 50 years from now, if there is a civilization, they will be celebrating, 50 years from this year, they will be celebrating the 300th birthday of Mozart. There's something about a great creative thinker that's different than popular culture. I'll be even more provocative. I, I remember one time reading on a place where you get such kinds of philosophy, namely a, 
a stall in a bathroom on a campus, <laughs> which said, eat shit. <laughs> 50 million flies can't be wrong. <laughs> Now, the fact that people like popular culture doesn't impress me very much. They sell large amounts of McDonald's so-called hamburgers. Millions of people went to see Scooby-Doo, too. <laughs> and as I said, American Idol was the biggest show in the country last week where you have people who can't sing, can't dance, uh, are a mess personally and, and, and so on, and yet people tune in. Why? I think some of it is at schadenfreude. People like to look at someone and say, that guy's terrible, because it makes you feel better about yourself. That's not a culture. That's a dung heap. Now, our society today is going to be destroyed if we don't address this question of how people think. And that's why we celebrate the anniversary of Mozart's 250th birth. And I'm going to give you some ideas tonight about this question that Lynn posed. We'll look at the string quartet. Now, it's not just that I play the violin that causes me to look at the string quartet. A number of years ago, we had prepared a uh, something called the Music Manual about singing and the different species of voices. And Lynn very enthusiastically said, now we're going to get to volume two, how string instruments reflect the principles of the singing voice. That is, with a violin, with a viola, a cello, a bass, you actually have a, a living quality. It's not fully alive, but you can make a string instrument sing. To some extent, you can do that with woodwinds. You can't really do it with brass. You can't do it with a piano. You can do certain things that are good with a piano if you know what you're doing, if you sing. But we were going to write volume two of the music manual, which we have not yet done, because the baby boomers in our organization were too committed to their own performance than they were to providing a work that would be of value 100, 200, 300 years from now. So I'm going to throw this out as a challenge to you, that the principles that I'll be discussing tonight, which are the same for singing and for musical instruments, the principles that were developed to, the, to a high degree by Mozart and then by his admirer Beethoven, that these principles should be incorporated into volume two of the music manual. And I'll open the door and give you a little bit of a uh, push in that direction. And since I plan to be around for quite a bit longer, I'm more than willing to collaborate with you to help make sure this, that this gets done. But let's start just briefly looking at the historic situation in which Mozart came into to get a better sense of, of who he is and what what we are looking at, what we're celebrating when we celebrate his birth. Uh, Marty, you want to let me have the first one, please? Let me turn out the lights. Oh. Whoa. Well, that's Salzburg. Actually, there it comes on better. That's the city where a little less than three weeks and 250 years ago, Mozart was born. In fact, this is the main cathedral. His birth house is somewhere over here. It's a beautiful little simple place. And it's open to the public. It's uh, well worthwhile going to see. Now, at the time, Salzburg was a city-state. And it was ruled by the leader of the Catholic Church in Salzburg. And Mozart was born to a musician. His father, Leopold, was a musician. His mother was someone who completely supported her husband. 
And Mozart was what you would really call a genius, who at the age of three was able to pick up the violin and play what he had just heard his father's uh, small ensemble play. He could play the piano lessons that his sister, who was five years older than he was, that, that she had played. So it was in this town in, that he was born. His father was a lackey to the cardinal. They did not have sovereign beings in Salzburg. And if you worked for the cardinal, you had no rights. Mozart's father had to wear the little, like a waiter's jacket. They were treated the same way they treated the cooks and the bottle washers. The musicians were treated simply as low-level servants. Now, Marty, the second one is number seven. I'm sorry for the confusion. All right. Now, Mozart was born in Vienna, which was in something called the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was the Habsburg Empire, and it was one of the powers in Europe at the time he was born in 1756. This empire, after the death of one of Mozart's patrons, the Emperor Joseph II, went into a downhill spill for a full century. And I would say that much of which shapes our culture today that's bad came out of the degeneration of the Habsburg Empire at the end of the 19th century. Start with Kandinsky and Clay in so-called uh, painting. Look at the music of the Strausses, Johann and Richard. Look at the real psychotic in that area, Sigmund Freud who was convinced that everybody was run by their penis or their children's father's or husband's penis. <laughs> now, Vienna, at the end of the 18th century, was a center of culture. Uh, Marty, let's go to, let's see, uh, number eight. Now, at that time, Europe was still threatened by the Ottoman Empire, which was quite a power, the so-called Turkish Empire. In fact, there were several times where Turkish troops had advanced up to the gates of Vienna. And there was constantly a sense that this would be the fight to save Christianity from the Muslim hordes. The Ottoman Empire centered in Turkey was the real power in that region. And as you know, the Balkan area, which includes Bosnia and Kosovo, which today are Muslim countries, are Muslim because of the settlements of the, the, the conquering by the Ottomans of that area. So you had this whole area was from time to time caught up in war. And at the time of Mozart's life, he lived from 1756 to 1791. During that period of time, there was constantly a threat to the Austro-Hungarian Empire that they would be attacked and invaded from uh, the Ottomans. Uh, the next one is number nine, Marty. This is a picture from 1683, which was a century earlier, but of the Turkish invasion and attack on Vienna. Um, Now, the other great power in the area was Prussia. And let me have number three, please, Marty. Do people recognize who we're dealing with here? Anyone from the Gauss group? Frederick the Great. The Great. All right, which one is Frederick? This is Frederick. <coughs> Whose legs are he admiring? <laughs> Voltaire. At the time that there were beginnings of reform in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, in Prussia, Frederick the Great was the king. And we'll learn more about Frederick because he's important to the story of Mozart's development. But Frederick, because of Prussia, because look, 
Austro, Austria was a Germanic-speaking country, as was Prussia. All of Europe was somewhat concerned of what might happen if Prussia and Austria ever linked up. And so it was essential to try and keep enmity between them. And for that purpose, Voltaire led a whole crew of Frenchmen into Prussia, into the court of Frederick in Berlin, including Maupertuis and others, Euler, to disrupt and destroy the potential that existed for German science, German arts, to link up in both Austria and uh, Prussia. Let's see. The next one is uh, number four, please. Now, the year that Mozart was born, there was a war called the Seven Years' War, 1756, which included the French-Indian War, as it's called in the United States or in the American colonies, but it included a war between Prussia and Austria. One of the decisive battles in that war occurred in 1757, and it was the famous Battle of Leuten, in which Frederick the Great ran a deception operation that fooled the Austrian army and led to a major victory by Prussia. But this war continued until 1763, uh, so that the first years of Mozart's life were years of, of very of, of fear on the one hand of the Turks and on the other hand, internal fighting between the Germanic-speaking powers. Um, all right, let me have uh, number two, please. This is Johann Sebastian Bach. Uh, Bach spent most of his creative life in the city of Leipzig, which is one of the two centers of the LaRouche Youth Movement now in uh, Germany. And I'll have more to say about Bach, but he was a, an important figure in music and an important figure in the development of Mozart. The next one, Marty, is... Ah, very good. Number five. That is Leopold Mozart, the father of Wolfgang Mozart. When Mozart was a young child, his father wrote a very influential book on violin playing. He was a creative artist on his own, but was never able to really break out of the confines of Salzburg. He believed it was necessary to submit to the ruling families in the town, in this case, the family of the Archbishop of Salzburg who ran the city. Uh, number uh, six, please, Marty. That is the, the mo famous painting of Mozart by his brother-in-law. Uh, Mozart, as we'll see, was an extraordinary figure who crammed into literally uh, 35 years an incredibly rich, creative life. Now, what we're going to look at today, uh, you can turn the lights on now, please. What we're going to look at tonight is the musical progression of Mozart. And what was Mozart's discovery, which enabled him to become the creative artist who deservedly is celebrated around the world? This is the year of Mozart. If you listen to K. Mozart, which is one of the major classical radio stations in this area, they're playing Mozart almost nonstop. It's really wonderful to drive around Los Angeles and hear Mozart. But what is it that someone does to become a creative genius of this type? Now, granted, it probably helped that from the day he was born, he was surrounded by music, choral music, singing. He learned to sing probably before he could talk. He was playing the violin. He was playing the piano at a very young age. And his father discovered he had an incredible 
ability to remember everything that he heard and replicate it and very soon playfully transform it. There are stories when he was a, a very young man on one of his first tours. When I say young man, young boy, six, seven, eight years old, when he was in London and spent time with Johann Christian Bach, where Johann Christian Bach was playing a piece that he had written, and he asked Mozart if he would like to play. He jumped on Christian Bach's lap and played the same piece and then did some improvisations. And it led to a friendship which lasted until the death of Bach, which was something that, that led Mozart to shed many tears. So as a young child, he toured Europe. His father took him to the centers of music, to, to all over Germany, to Italy, where he studied with Padre Martini, who had also worked with Bach in teaching him counterpoint. He met many people in Paris. He was in London. Many of the places he went, the people his father took him to meet were people who later were friends and allies of Benjamin Franklin. It was a network of people that included scientists, philosophers, and especially musicians and people of the theater. And during this time, Mozart's compositional powers increased literally by the month. If you listen to some of the early pieces, you hear this transformation from simple musical ideas. And when I say simple, I mean, let's face it, he, he could do something when he was 12 years old that very few people ever have done in a full life. But he developed, he kept, he had an insatiable desire to look at other music and to work on it. And one of the people whose music profoundly affected him was Franz Joseph Haydn, who in 1771 initiated what became the revolution, the Haydn-Mozart revolution in music. Now, I'll come back to this in a moment, but Haydn wrote a series of quartets, Opus 20. They're called the Sun Quartets, six of them. And what Haydn did was to take the four instruments of a quartet and say, we're going to elevate the cellist. We're not going to turn the cellist into what is today the equivalent of a bass guitarist. Someone who strums two or three chords for about four hours while fireworks are going off on stage and crowds are going nuts. But he started, he said, we're going to put some music on the bass line with the cello. Then it's not just going to be an, a rhythmic bass line plus filler from the second violin and the viola and then the, the virtuoso being the first violin. But the second violin and the viola part began to have some interplay that was important in developing a musical idea. So instead of one voice and essentially three accompaniments, you had four sovereign voices, beginning with the 1771 Sun Quartet. Now Mozart, who had been playing around with quartets, he wrote some very early quartets, 1770, he was 14 years old, and he wrote a number of them. But after hearing Haydn's Opus 20 and studying them, he wrote six quartets, very similar, that assimilated aspects of Haydn's style. Now, Haydn didn't write any more quartets for a decade. And after 1773, when Mozart finished the, these six quartets, he didn't write quartets either for a decade. But he did play around with the ideas. I want to give you an example of uh, something he wrote in 1776 at the age of 21. It was in honor of his sister's birthday. She had just turned 26. His sister's name was Anna Maria, but they called her non Earl. Uh, and they called him Wolf Earl. Earl, I guess, E R L at the end was somewhat of a like little Wolfy, uh, little non. Uh, Frank, can you put this on number five, please? Now, what you're going to hear is a quartet, which, if you could turn it out, there's a string quartet. Um, 
I actually want to do that. It's a string quartet that's composed along with an oboe and two horns. Now, you'll hear something that, that's pleasant, but not fully developed. And you'll, you'll pick it up because you'll notice there's a slightly repetitious aspect to it. But I think there's something important about this particular piece, which is that the initial theme from the first movement that you'll hear right now, which is a, a, called a French march, uh, actually is heard through all of the six following movements. And so it's one of the first times for Mozart that you have what later was developed in the Haydn Mozart Revolution under the name Motiv Furung, Motiv, M O T I V, F U H R I N G. Now, Furung is the, from the same print, uh, uh, verb as Führer, that is leader. So, Motiv Furung is a leading motif or a leading theme which is continued in the whole piece, which is developed throughout the whole piece, you don't necessarily hear that same theme at all points, but there are interval, intervals that are similar or the same that are developed with an increasing density of transformations in the piece. Now, this is a very early one. Uh, why don't you... Well, I, yeah. It's Kershaw... Um, 250, All right, so you get the idea. It's nice, it's pleasant. There's some change in it, but not a whole lot. Now, eight years later, he composed um, this piece. Let me make sure I have the right one here. Yeah, this is also number five. This is one of the so-called Haydn quartets, one of the six that he wrote after Haydn in 1781-82 affected his musical revolution. This is one of the quartets that Mozart wrote to honor Haydn, or in Haydn's honor, which is a stunning revolutionary piece that we'll come back to later, but I just want you to hear the difference. Yeah. cello, you're all the instruments.
Now we'll come back to that. Could you hear a difference between the two pieces in eight years? Well, what accounts for that change? What was it besides just normal intellectual development of a creative mind? What happened between 1776 and 1784 was the discovery by Mozart, along with Haydn, of the system of composition developed by Johann Sebastian Bach. And what you have is the coming together of physical principles that are part of the musical universe, along with a highly refined and developed artistic capability. And we're going to look at what it was that Mozart saw in Bach. We're going to go through it with a little bit of deliberation, a little slowly, to make sure that the point gets across, and then you can explore it more on your own. But let's start with what are the physical principles. Because what Lynn has been addressing recently is that the limb, for all the good work that's being done, seems to be blocking on the physical scientific principles which underlie music. Now, when we say physical scientific principles, we don't mean rules or formal systems. But in fact, there is a musical universe which is created or, or either is a subordinate part of the same process that you're looking at when you investigate the night sky or when you engage in constructive geometry, working on the platonic solids. Because where do notes come from? What generates a note? What's the first time man was aware of notes? It's from the singing voice. Now, some people argue that before you had the singing voice, you had geometers madly going about dividing strings. <laughs> and that music comes from the arithmetic geometrical principles involved in dividing a string. If you have a string and you cut it in half, you get an octave. You create other intervals by dividing it in half again so that you have quarters or two-thirds creates another one. And supposedly, by dividing strings, you can produce the notes of a scale. Now, there was a paradox that was apparent to the people who were working on this in Greece, namely the so-called Pythagoreans, who were the greatest geometers of their time. And they noticed the paradox in the following way, that as you divided a string to create a higher and higher note, and you measured the frequencies, that you, you, the higher you went, you started noticing discrepancies, that the same note that should be there. For example, an octave is when you hear a note that sounds the same. One is lower and one is higher. Um, you know, on, a, on a violin, does that note sound the same? It's a G, or you can have. There's several ways you can make that same note. But as you move up and down the string, what you find is there are discrepancies. And my dear friend Anna is always ready to discuss them with you. It's called the Pythagorean comma. And so what was discovered, and by Bach's time it was known very well, that there were several ways of tuning an instrument. But in order to resolve that, the, the problem is if you had it simply with equal divisions and you tried to play a number of scales, pretty soon your notes would be off. And the same interval, a so-called half step on a violin, on a higher string would not sound the same as it would on a lower string. One way to get the same general idea is if you have a soprano and a tenor singing the same note. Do we have a volunteer, a soprano and a tenor who can just sing a couple of notes for us to, okay, Michelle? Yeah, come up here. Do we have a tenor? 
practically everyone here is a tenor. Someone just step up. All right, okay. All right, so Danny, would you hit a middle C? No, do. Do, do. Now, do they sound alike? Really? Now, if if there were a screen here, so you didn't know it was a man and a woman, but you heard the notes, would it sound the same? Why not? Two different voices. Why else? Well, let's hear an octave higher. See what that does to it. Do they sound the same? It's the same note, but they sound different because they're different species of singing voices. And so when you take, thank you, uh, if, we, if I had worked with them and had them go up and down and sing in thirds and fifths, you would find something different occurring in their voices. That a low note and a high note vary of the same note. You can take, for example, the same G I played earlier. You definitely hear a difference in them. Now, if you keep extending that, and if you go up and down a scale, you're going to hear notes differently. For example, on a violin, there's a difference between the way a note sounds on one string and another. For example, when you play a scale, you're usually told going up, when you hit the fourth, the fifth rather, you play the open string, so it's... Now, how does that sound compared to this? Can you hear the difference? Going up or down, sometimes you'll find that the notes sound differently, whether you play a fourth finger and in order to keep it within the modality, within the tuning, you have to make slight adjustments. This is what Lynn talks about when he says flatten or sharpen the note. That it's not always the same. Now, what determines that? This is where the, the second question comes in. First, we have well-tempering, that you tune instruments differently. But the well-tempered system was developed in Bach's time one of the people who worked on it was a man named Werkmeister, who said, the greatest musician known to me is Johannes Kepler. That was from Werkmeister. And Bach took the system that he was working on with some others, including Werkmeister, and he wrote a piece called The Well-Tempered Clavier. This was in 1722. And what Bach did, and we're going to investigate the well-tempered clavier in a few minutes, what he did was demonstrate with well-tempering, you could play all the major and minor scales without having to make serious adjustments. That is, there is a tuning by which you could have all the sharps and all the flats and go across all the strings or on the piano, because he did it on the piano, without losing the basic tuning that you started with. So with the well-tempering, the second thing that's added is something that was known for many, many centuries and was particularly revived during the Renaissance called bel canto vocal registration, which is what you heard when you heard uh, Michelle and Alan sing. The creation of a note with the original instrument, the human singing voice. And here's something that's interesting. All tenors change into different registers at the same note. That is that whether you're six feet eight, eight inches tall or five two, whether your vocal apparatus is bigger like Nick Walsh or smaller like Hector, 
you still change at the same place. Now, what does that mean? It means that the, the, the cavities in the body that produce the note change from the chest voice, which is the low register, to a sort of middle register, which includes the lower jaw, the throat, and the chest, to the head voice, the upper register, where you're using your sinuses. You're using the whole head to produce a note. There's a different quality of tone in each of the registers. Um, if, again, if I had worked with someone, I'd have someone get up and sing it to demonstrate that. But you can do that on your own. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, grab a singer from the limb and have them show you after we're done. Now, if you take the well tempering, which corresponds to the singing voice, and which scientifically they chose the do, what we know as the middle C, at 256 reverberations. That's the frequency. And the tuning started from that. You would have discrepancies at the total, at the top, and at the bottom. But essentially, you could work within it. So that Bach's development of the well-tempered clavier was a system which was not mathematical but was shaped by the human singing voice and the mind's ability to compose music appropriate for the use of the singing voice. Now, the third aspect of Bach's work, which is critical for Mozart, is something called well-tempered cross-voice polyphony. What you heard before when you heard the male tenor and the female soprano voice, the differences. What happens when you put the voices together so that you have polyphony, more than one voice, and you have them in relationship to each other, where you can go up, both voices can go up, they can go up in thirds together. One voice can go up and the other go down. You can have them going up and down. You can have many, many variations. But what Bach did was show certain kinds of lawfulness in the relationships between the voices, but not just between the voices, but between the so-called keys, the scales, the major minor scales, and showing the interrelationship between them so you could compose by going from one scale to another. So instead of just having a piece where the whole piece was uh, a C major, Suppose you had only those notes to write a piece. Well, what about this note? That doesn't exist in the C major scale. There's no F sharp. That's the note that divides the scale in half from C. That's right in the middle. And that's something called the Lydian interval. You hear them together. That's called a dissonance. It's not harmonic. If you hear a third, that, except for my violin playing, that sounds nice. <laughs> you know, a fifth. There are various notes you can put together that sound nice. This doesn't. But the introduction of the F sharp into the C major scale, as we'll see, is called a boundary condition. It's the point at which you can enter into a new scale. So if you have this, what the mind starts hearing is the next note. That's a new scale. So from the C, which has no sharps, go to the G major scale, which has the F sharp in it. Now, the G major scale has no C. What happens if you put a C in a G major scale? You have the same thing. But again, as the boundary condition, you 
you derive a scale that has the F sharp and the C sharp. And you can do that through the whole major scales. That introduction of the dissonance, the anomaly, the singularity that divides the scale is a boundary condition that moves you into the next scale. Now, what's the relationship between the various keys? And that's what Bach explored in something called the well-tempered clavier, which we'll get to in just a moment. But there's one more point that we have to introduce. I've already told you about this, but this was the Haydn-Mozart revolution, the principle of multiforum, the unity of effect, that you can introduce these boundary condition singularities, but you must always maintain a unity of effect, a single idea. And the purpose of a composition is to, in a sense, test that idea by introducing increasing density of singularities, more notes that are outside of the key but keep you back with that one idea. So you could, for example, do it arbitrarily where you'd have something like well, I, I can't even do it on the violin. Just pound out some notes, Danny. <laughs> All right, that's Danny Bear's first piano concerto. <laughs> and, you know, he could probably get it performed by Essa Pecker Solonen or whatever his name is, the uh, conductor of the L.A. Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> Danny, I think you have to do a couple more minutes before you can get it published, but it, it would work. That was arbitrary notes. Where is it going? I, I want to come, let me just make a point here and I'll come back to this Bach, Mozart, Haydn revolution. What's known as modern music, which some people say, well, we had the classical period and at a certain day, <laughs> Beethoven decided <laughs> enough of the classics, I'm going romantic. You know, in the, the movie uh, Immortal Beloved basically says that Beethoven became a romantic because he couldn't get the girl he wanted. And in that movie, it was his, his uh, brother's wife. But the idea that there are these periods is, is wrong. The so-called romantic period, just as the if you have the academic term, they say the Baroque and classical was highly law and rule driven. And then suddenly people in the 1800s didn't want to be contained by these arithmetic laws. And so they wanted to let their emotions go. And so you had the Benthamite structure of harmony, which was oh so good, and then pain and that was dissonance. And the reason for dissonance was to get you back to harmony so you could feel good. Now, this is, this is what's wrong with academic approaches to anything. The attempt to impose rules and laws on a creative mind doesn't work. And what Bach did and Mozart, they studied the lawgivers. There was a lawgiver in music named Fuchs who claimed that he had constructed the, the laws by which music should be composed. In fact, what Fuchs said is counterpoint is a composition which is written according to the rules. And in case you don't know what the rules were, he wrote a book, The Rules of Counterpoint. <laughs> now Bach read that. So did Mozart. Well, many of you have read Newton. Does that make you a Newtonian? Well, well has anyone here read Newton? Didn't you, Nick? You just did a class on it. Have you become a Newtonian? No. Okay. Are <laughs> I mean, reading somebody who, who does some, who's known for a field doesn't make you a follower of that. Now, Fuchs set up his rules of counterpoint. And what we'll see is how uh, Bach violated these rules. But let me get to the key point here, which was the discovery of Bach's music by Haydn and Mozart. We're going to try and replicate in a few minutes what they actually discovered. 
but I just want to give you a couple of quotes from this collaboration. It was centered around a man named Baron Gottfried von Sweeten, who was the son of the personal physician to the Empress, uh, Maria Therese of Austria. And he became the director of the Imperial Court Library in Vienna after 1777. Beethoven's first symphony was dedicated to him, so he was very prominent in the musical world. Mozart, on April 10, 1782, wrote a letter to his father in which he said, I go every Sunday at 12 o'clock to Baron von Sweeten, where nothing is played but Handel and Bach. I am collecting at the moment the fugues of Bach, not only of Sebastian, but also of Emanuel and Friedman. Now, von Sweeten, before he became court librarian, from 1770 to 1777, was the ambassador for the imperial court. He was the charge d'affaires at the Prussian court in Berlin. Now, remember, we saw Frederick the Great hanging out with Voltaire. He also hung out with Bach, that he had Bach come to his court. And von Swieten writes about his encounter 20-some years later with Frederick the Great. He sent a letter to Kaunitz, who was the interior minister. See, the charge d'affaires is an intelligence position. He's supposed to keep watch on what's going on in Berlin. So what did he do? Imagine what Dick Cheney wants to know. You went to see the Iranian president. Did he have weapons of mass destruction in his turban? Did he have radioactive uranium in his beard? Well, here's what von Sweeten wrote. He said he talked to King Frederick the Great, and he said he spoke to me, among other things, of music and of a great organist named Bach. And he said, well, those who knew his father, because the Bach he was talking about was probably Carl Philip Emanuel Bach. But von Swieten says, while those who knew his father claimed that he in turn was even greater, the king is of this opinion, that is, that Johann Sebastian Bach was the greater Bach. And to prove it to me, he sang aloud a chromatic fugue subject, which he had given this old Bach, who on the spot had made a fugue in four parts, then in five parts, and finally in eight parts. Now, first of all, imagine a king who can compose a, a chromatic musical line, and then 30 years later sing it and describe to an ambassador how this piece worked. Now, this was called the musical offering. And what von Swieten did is that when he went back to Vienna, he brought the music of Johann Sebastian Bach to his house, and that was the subject of the musical Sundays, the Monge Brigades, you might say, with Haydn and Mozart. Salieri was there, some of the musicians, top musicians, Michael Haydn on occasion, and Franz Josef Haydn where they would play from the art of the fugue, the well-tempered clavier. There's a description of Mozart sitting at the keyboard playing while singing one of the parts with Salieri, Joseph Haydn, and von Swieten singing the other parts. Now, what were these parts? Well, let's take a look at what Bach did with the well-tempered clavier. I'm just going to show you one initially. To give you a sense of the, the bottom part. Let's see. Right. Now, let's put it a little bit lower. <coughs> In a fugue, the Fuchs argument is that you must repeat the same intervals exactly when you introduce the second voice that you had for the first voice, <coughs> except a fourth or a fifth higher. Now, in this fugue, which you probably would know if you heard it, bum, 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 you start on a C. Uh, Danny, do you just want to play a, a, a low C? And then the second voice comes in, a fifth higher on G. 
And so, and you'll see that there's, the intervals are exactly the same. So he seems to be following Fuchs's rules. But what he introduces very quickly, because they're not the same, you're talking about different notes, you're beginning to get into a different key. So you stretch it as far as you can, but right here we see the introduction of the F sharp. And so you have, again, if you think of the, just play a C and an F sharp. So in order to continue developing the voices, he starts to move into a new key. And you have then the F sharp in the top voice, uh, the F sharp here again, and then as it moves on, he introduces other notes which don't exist. This is a fugue in C major. Again, none of the sharps exist in C major. But Bach introduces them so the lines can play together without having the whole piece thrown off. Now, we're going to look at a second. This was in 1722, that first piece. Now, 20 years, or by the way, the importance, one of the important things about this is that 1722 was the well-tempered clavier. The Jesu Mina Freude was written a year later. And what he did for the piano or the clavier, he then started doing these same experiments with the vocal polyphony, with the chorus. Now, 20 years later, he wrote book two, where he did the same thing. That is, he did a series of fugues with the major and minor keys. Now, there's a difference in this one, which we'll look at. Is that as clear as this gets? Okay. All right, that's better. Now, here you'll, and we're going to work on this for a couple of minutes. So here you see the opening three notes of the, the idea of this piece. Now, his second voice comes in, and it's a fourth above, but he changes it. It's instead of the interval of the third, which he starts with, it's just a, a whole step, a second. And so right away, he's violated Fuchs's discussion of how a fugue works. Now, when you go back to have the second announcement of the first voice in the bass, it's back the same way. But what you'll hear when we, we're going to listen to this, first of all, on the, uh, first of all, we're going to hear it with the clavier. Then you're going to hear something interesting that Mozart did with this. So let me give you How is this one on here? I think it may be the, the first. Let me just. Um, try number. Oh no! Try the uh, first. The, the first one. Yeah. This is the the clavier playing. I want to show you something that this is a piece which Mozart then wrote as a string quartet. So here you're hearing it on a clavier, two hands on a, a prototype of what became a piano. But the notes you'll hear are very short. Bop, 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 bop. There's not much carryover. So there's something interesting that happens that you don't really hear on the clavier that I, I just want to point out. So just play that again, please. Well, actually, before you do, what you have here is an interesting progression. You have a G. Let me just... Uh, a G. 
then an A flat, then an F. So it's just four notes when you hear them played separately. Now listen to how it sounds on the clavier, and then we're going to see what Mozart heard with that. So go ahead and play. Now, go to the second one. Now, what... Okay, stop it. Now, did you hear the two notes together? The... Listen to it again, because what Mozart... What he started to do was take Bach apart to look at what is this process of well-tempered cross-voice polyphony. What do different notes sound like together? What directionality can you get from it? And how do you then uh, unfold it further? So this is Mozart composing for a string quartet the piece that Bach wrote in the well-tempered clavier for a piano. So let's set number two again, and we'll listen to a little more of it this time. And you hear the third voice. Most of these, I'd, I'd love to play the whole thing, but we'd be here all night. <laughs> but this is this is a beautiful little recording. It's called Bach Shea Mozart. It was done by some uh, someone in France, based on a piece of music that's almost impossible to find. My wife got this for me this year for my 56th birthday, and she was calling all over the world in order to get it. But this is the transcription by Mozart of the Bach Well-Tempered Clavier. Now I'd like you to listen just one more time to the first part, to the piece on the clavier. And then Anna and I, who have not really rehearsed this, are going to play the two violin parts so that you can hear live, hopefully, what it sounds like for the strings. So start with the, yeah. All right, why don't you stop it? All right, so we will now give you a sense of what Mozart did. At least we're going to play about the first four measures, and then we're going to come back and play it a second time and stop on these notes so you can actually hear the changes that come about when you put different notes against each other as part of this principle of well-tempered uh, cross-voice polyphony. Now, we're going to do the first, we're going to come to this, 
only this time we're going to hold the notes so you can hear what sort of just passes by. So what, what I want to point out to you is that as we look at more complex pieces, there are things that are written into the music that are incredibly dense transformations, they're, they're dissonances. But Mozart, part of his genius was to make it sound beautiful. And so that you'd be hearing this, and instead of hearing the harshness, you'd be anticipating the resolution and the development. And this is why many of you underestimate Mozart and say, ah, he just had some pretty tunes. He actually was a revolutionary scientist. All right, so we we'll get to this part. We'll hold it, okay? Okay. This part? Yeah, right there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So you hear that? Now then we'll play it again and you'll see how it resolves and moves on. All right, now, now we're going to take a look at something that Haydn did then. As Mozart was working on these pieces, Haydn and he were collaborating. And in fact, there was a period of time where Haydn was almost a teacher to Mozart, which is why we have this bad joke of, uh, you know why you couldn't find Mozart's teacher? Because he was hiding. <laughs> now, we're going to take a quick look at, at something that Haydn did. Hey, Nick. Nick, as they say, you're, sometimes you're often boxed. Never mind. This is music school bullshit. <laughs> what was that? What did he say? <laughs> All right. Now, I don't have a recording of this, but Anna and I will just give a demonstration of what you're hearing. This is Opus 33, the so-called Russian quartets of Haydn. This was written in the period of time when he was working with Mozart at Baron von Sweeten's house. And they began to introduce deliberately the kind of transformations that were that created new music. That is, they used the classical principles, but Haydn himself said this is something new. Now what you have here, and if you could just get your violin and um, you have initially what just sounds like a chord, a simple uh, it's in C, so it's a C major chord. Play a, uh, a G, C, and then E. No, I'm sorry. Uh, um, yeah, an, an E, C, and a G. Yeah. Now, if you had that... Uh, well, E, G, I, you play just on the D string, E, G, and then C. I'm sorry, E, G, and then C. The E and the G on the D string. So it's just part of a, a chord. Now, the way it's introduced by Haydn, though, is a transformation because he's immediately introducing 
a shift using the Lydian again. So you, you start out, you hear with the viola in E, second violin C, and then the first violin a G. So we're going to just play this. You should just play the, the second violin part. Uh, we'll just play up to here. Just play the C and then I'll play an F. Just it starts out. So that's a fifth. But then what do you hear? And what is that? The Lydian. Now, this comes in at this point. Let's just do that. Um, we'll start in the second measure. What you have is an introduction of a change, the boundary condition, right at the beginning. Now then the second voice comes in, and just play an F, D, and an A. The F on the E string, then a D on the A string. So again, you, you've had a shift now. You started the first time with the second violin on the C, now it's moved up a step to the D. So it's a, just a one step. So you have a simple change. But what does Haydn do with this one? So let's just start here. Anna's playing the second violin. I'll be playing the first part. Okay. So what you have is now another, what? Let's hear the D and the... So again, you have the Lydian, but it's in a completely different key. So you're introducing a potential, which then you have the G sharp, A, B flat, So you're introducing a whole series of notes that don't exist in that second key. So even though you're in the key of C, by the seventh measure, you're in a completely different key, but you're, you're in a sense, uh, moving out of that key very quickly. And then the third part, it's play a B flat, a D, and then a G. So then... At this part, you're playing the D, and the first violin is on the G, the high G. Now listen to that. So let's let's just play these two measures. I know we didn't work on it, but. So now you hear these things when we play it like this slowly. Thanks. We'll, we have one more to do. But when you hear it played, you don't hear that. What you're hearing is this series of transformations. So your mind is racing ahead. Where is he going next? In this piece, the little trill, the... Uh, or the is carried out through all the four movements. And it's called, because of that, the bird quartet. Because if it's played well, it sounds like a bird. But what you're seeing is, again, a series of introductions of new ideas. Now then that brings us back to the famous dissonance quartet. 
And Anna, once again, if you will join me. Now, this one is also in C major. But here's the interesting thing. See if you can figure out if you hear a single aspect of C major in this opening. So let me put this up here. If you can just lower it, please. All right, the first note, the cello comes in on a C. Just play a low C. Then the viola comes in on an A-flat. Play an A-flat. Is that, is that an A-flat? Yeah, there you go. Then the second violin comes in on a low E-flat. No, on the D-string. So your first three notes are... So what do you think the next note is? Well, you might think A flat, but instead it's So do it again. Keep keep playing your And then it moves on with the Anna goes to a, a is that a C sharp? Yeah, on the second violin. Mm -hmm. C sharp against an A. Then a D. That's playing in tune. That's the way it's written. So. And. Now, what key is that in? It's supposed to be in the key of C. But there's almost nothing in it. Mozart is now writing in all keys at once. So um, let's just go back to that and, and listen to it again. And then I have one more thing I want to finish with, and then we'll take some time for questions. Whoops. Oh, OK. This one is uh, number five. So see if you can follow it with the music. And this time we're going to listen to what happens after the introduction.
you have downward motion in the second violin, upward motion, chromatic in the viola. You're all over the place. He's got a little sforzando on the C sharp. Now listen to the key. Now, what you're beginning to hear is four voices going in different directions shaped by these modalities, the, the uh, Lydian modes and other modes. And that what the modes do is they're sort of windows into other keys. They're points of transformation, which are lawfully unfolded. Now, I want to conclude just by giving you a sense of the unbelievable power that Mozart developed in the last years of his life. And one only wonders what could have happened had he lived longer so that his acquaintance with Beethoven would have been more than one brief encounter, after which Mozart is reported to have said to his friends, keep an eye on that young man. He's going to amount to something. Now, what Mozart did with opera using the singing voice with strings was to show that you could introduce completely different concepts in verbal ideas while at the same time keeping a unity. Now, there are some of these. The Marriage of Figaro is just quite incredible with this. And what we're going to hear is one piece where the count is planning the seduction or rape of Susanna. And Susanna doesn't want to do it. But she's trying to figure out how to trap this guy. So she makes a deal with the countess. Let's go ahead and follow this through and we'll catch him. And so this is one of the seduction scenes where you'll hear the count start in a minor key and he's singing, will you meet me? Can we get together? And she's leading him on. But she says, see, no, see, no. You'll hear the back and forth. But at a certain point, she says, okay, I will. And the count goes into a major key. You'll hear a total transformation in brightness. And then the two of them are singing together. And he's saying, oh, how wonderful it will be. And she's saying, please, all those who love, please forgive me. So it's two completely different conceptions and the ideas, but one musical idea. And it's a whole opera that's written this way. At the end of the second act, you have a septet or octet where you have the count and his lackeys all singing about, isn't this going to be great? We're going to really get them. Then you have the countess, Susanna, and Figaro singing three different things, and yet you have an incredible interweaving of one musical idea. The Marriage of Figaro is a musical idea from beginning to end almost four hours. And it's a political attack on oligarchism. But what we're going to listen to here, and this is number eight. This is the Count and Susanna.
borrowing a little here. So listen to the orchestra. change. Just so you know, in the end of the opera, <clears throat> they catch, they trap the count. And in the very end, you have the count who thinks he's closing in on Susanna after he's already said he's never going to forgive anybody. And he turns around and he grabs her and turns around and it's his wife, disguised as Susanna, in front of the whole village. <laughs> At which point, he falls down and says, will you forgive me? And she says, yes. Now, two years later, a similar character, Don Giovanni, when the devil comes at the final meal and says, will you repent? Don Giovanni says, no, 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 and goes straight down to hell. <laughs> and so in the marriage of Figaro, Mozart still hoped that there could be a peaceful resolution. But he had no illusions. He did not give an inch to the oligarchy. And that's probably why he died young. He probably was murdered. But just from this little initiation to some of you, maybe uh, most of you are familiar to some extent with Mozart, what you're listening to is a creative mind taking up the, the, the physical aspects of the scientific approach to music, what you might call the natural beauty of a musical system. Not a series of notes, but musical ideas. Some people get confused on what a musical idea is. A musical idea is not something you can put in words. It's a conception. It's a couple of intervals that are developed across the range of the musical the, the universe of music. But what they reflect in the hands or what they represent in the hands of someone like Mozart is an ability to demonstrate transformation and change to take your mind through that musical geometry and the transformation of that musical geometry in a lawful way and test you and challenge you but give you an understanding at the end of that one idea from the beginning to the end. And that's what very few people understand. That's the principle of multifora. And Norbert Breinin, the great and unfortunately late violinist from the Amadeus Quartet, he passed away last year, he became a great friend of Lyndon LaRouche. And they used to talk about this principle 
of the changes that are necessary to sustain the modality, the tuning. The idea that sometimes you raise or lower a note, sharpen or flatten, in singing, in a chorus, and in a string quartet, but that you always sustain the unity of idea. And Brynine said at one occasion, you know, Lynn, I think we're the only two people in the world who understand this. <laughs> and Lynn took that, and he wrote a series of papers, including one called The Mozart Revolution. And he's bringing this up over and over and over when someone asks him about why, what do we do after we master the Azer? What next? And Lynn comes back to this, that through choral music, you master these principles of cross-voice polyphony. And similarly, in the string quartet, you have something that represents the same process. In the hands of someone as gifted as Mozart, you have music of almost undescribable beauty. It's what, what Keats said, that the sweetest her melodies are those unheard. In a sense, your mind is being organized by Mozart to hear something that otherwise couldn't exist for you. And that's why Mozart is a sublime composer. And studying Mozart, letting him organize your mind, is a way that, that you will find increasing capability to master the principles in music that are necessary for us to improve and, and upgrade the choral work overall. So since I'm losing my voice now, let me stop at that and uh, open for questions. Well, Bach, look, if you, if you want to have fun, listen to Pablo Casals playing Bach piano pieces, and you hear him singing. He sings as he's playing. Listen to him conduct the Marlboro String Orchestra, which is young people. And he's doing the Brandenburg Concertos, and he's singing away. <laughs> because I think the, the point is that all music has to be sung to be able to be performed properly. Something like the, uh, uh, the, the Bach piece that Mozart wrote for the quartet. Uh, Mihua has taken one of them and is writing, has written it for, a, for a three voices, singing voices, uh, because that's there. And when you, what she did in order to do it is that she had to figure out, first of all, which voice is which based on what the registration. Where would there be a change in the voice if it were a tenor or a soprano or an alto or a bass? And then how do you replicate that on a string instrument is, is what Mozart looked at. So Mozart sang the Bach well-tempered clavier and from singing he then knew which instrument, which of the stringed instruments to do. There's a, if, if you, I think we have this Bach Shea Mozart on the limb site, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but there are, I think, five or eight of these pieces from the well-tempered clavier where you hear the, the, the clavier and then you hear the string quartet. So I would urge people to listen to it. And then uh, maybe what we can do is we can make some copies of this rare piece of music. In fact, you know what we had to do? We wanted to... Uh, get them broken down so that we could pass them out and have four parts. And uh, the University of Texas was one of the few places in the world that actually had it. And Natalie had to come up with a very sneaky way of getting in there to make sure we could get it. Uh, so we now have the, the individual parts. But this is something that just should be available. So people can work on it and sing it and do what they want with it. Yeah, Alan. Can you explain these modalities well, I'm, I'm not going to go through the, the modalities as a whole. Just think about this question, what you hear with the, the most simple one, the C major, the F sharp, the Lydian, the... But if you have the F sharp... 
This is something which doesn't exist in the C major scale. But it's something which points to the next key, the next scale. That's what you're dealing with. Now, when you have something like that, it opens up a possibility for adding the next scale or the next scale or a shift into the minor. And so it's, in a sense, what, what uh, Bruce describes as a boundary condition, which means it's something which tells you you're no longer in C major. Now, you can keep in C major with that, or you can go into G major, or you could use that to then add the C sharp to go into the next major scale. Well, some people tonight were working on the Ave Verum. I would recommend that the, the, the Lydians and the, the intervals are all over the, the Yezu, but the beautiful thing about the Mozart Ave Verum is it's compact, and it's very easy to see how the Lydian changes both in terms of the language but also the direction, the, the music and the piece. So... Um, you know, we, people are working on that, aren't they? Some people working in the Ave Vera. One thing that's interesting, I listened to th when you were rehearsing it tonight, the, the Ave Vera is written with a violin accompaniment. You know, it's something like... But the, uh, there are parts where you have with a cuyos. Are cu cuyos... Yeah, that there's a rest, there's no singing, and the violin will help you get the note. If you don't have it, it's more difficult. You had the problem with that when you were singing it. So, you know, you look at this and you, you, you have to understand this principle of registration. For, because that's how Bach and Mozart wrote. The singing was absolutely essential for the... Uh, and Bach was trying to make a dead piano sing, a clavier sing. Uh, Tanya, you had a question? Um, where can you get the dissonance like that? And, uh, where? And the sun, I mean, the clavier. Because I you have them, right? Yes, I do. If you're, if you're nice to me, I might let you have them someday. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the secret is if you know my wife and, and you're nice to her, she'll produce them for you. No, the, there's a quartet. The one you should hear play this is the Amadeus Quartet. Uh, because what the way Brynin said you have to do this is the quartet would sit down to play it. And they'd play it with every note in tune because they had perfect pitch, perfect intonation. And they discovered that because of this principle of modality and transformation, that if you play every note in tune, it doesn't work. And so what Brynin said, Lynn said, well, how did you practice? Brynin said, we'd play it over and over and over, and we'd say, let's play it again. Listen, let's play it again. And you find, as I showed you, for example, with the difference between um, an open string versus a fourth finger or a second finger in the third position, the note sometimes will sound better. Now, I've been playing a lot over the years the Bach double violin concerto, which is another good way to do that because there are some places where it's written in that you have a harmonic as opposed to, you know, the, the harmonic is when you have an octave but you don't press down, so it's... And you wonder, that sometimes has a truer sound than if you... And so why does Bach do that? You have to look at the direction. Is he going up or down? What's the other violin doing? And sometimes if you just come down the... Sometimes when you have an open string, it doesn't sound right against the other violin, the other uh, voice. So you have to... It's almost the same. But there's a, there's a difference. This is what Lynn means when he says sharpen or flatten. And the Amadeus Quartet, through their studies and their, their, their knowledge of the piece from the inside, 
They knew how to do that. So when you hear it, it seems it's seamless. And you don't realize that some of the notes they're playing are not technically exact pitch. Now, similarly, in the, uh, I think it's the Air Abru, the, the Yezu, is that the one that has the, the fugue where everyone, the, yeah. the tenor and then the soprano always go off? <laughs> if you listen, I mean, it's partly the tenors have problems with that. It's difficult. But I've seen you work on it where you sing over and over and over the sectional, and you sing the notes right, and then you put the two together and it doesn't work. And the tenors always throw, let's be honest, the tenors throw off the sopranos. <laughs> now, there's, this is where if you watch the way John Seegerson works on it, maybe Frank knows a little bit about it, John will sometimes tune it a little lower. In that case, I think you have to tune the tenors a little higher. Because the tenors start to drop, next thing you know you're down a half step and it falls apart. And then everyone ends on the right note, but you have a muddy section in there instead of absolute transparency. So that's something that Lynn has been discussing. Now with, what's interesting is Lynn says with the, with the chorus, the individual section can't hear it. Why is that? Well, when you're singing, you don't get a true hearing of your own voice. That's why all of us think we sing so well in the shower. You know, we're, we're hearing an idealized voice. Then you get in a chorus, and you know, the conductor's going, you know, making faces, and you think, well, well, that's the right note. You can hear the other voices, but you can't really hear yours. With a quartet, you can hear it. You can hear if you're in or out of tune, your voice and the others. So a quartet actually can tune itself. A chorus needs a conductor to do that. And that's one of the things Lynn is saying, that the reason to keep working on the Yezu and to perfect it is so that you can have a number of people who experience as conductors how to have that slight sharp or flat to have all the voices work so that you're going in the right direction. Um, yeah? Um, there's a, uh, I, I guess in terms of bringing it back to where you started at the beginning, Mm -hmm. With the idea of civilization, yes, and it's pending doom if we don't do the right thing. You have a, a a real stark idea that Lynn's been bringing up, and that people have been questioning him on over the past few cadre schools, things on music and, and some other things. And in terms of what you brought up with the volume two, or what would be volume two of the music manual, there's a specific amount of work that needs to go into it, a huge amount of work that needs to go into it which is going to take a lot of, uh, sort of a lot of push for it. So the same work that we've put into, the same excitement, the same attention that we've put into the Gauss mm -hmm. and, and the Riemann, which is really good, and you've seen a transformation, you've seen the capability of more and more people to grasp onto what Bruce has been presenting and even what Lynn's been presenting, and being able to present certain questions to Lynn that Lynn's been trying to bring out for 30 years with the boomers. He, it seems like he wants the same thing with the music. When he's, he's saying little things and poking at certain things. Mm -hmm. but, but the idea that it can't be, I mean, because you, you, you have classes like this which are, which are really exciting, but then somehow people lose the idea. People lose the idea of the initial rigor which sparked mm -hmm. the idea for the class. Mm -hmm. The idea that you had in your mind about, you know, this is, this is the actual stuff necessary to save civilization. And that if we don't reproduce it, as Beltran said the other day, the shit's gone. Right? <laughs> so... We have to think on that level with the majority of things that are presented to us by Lynn. And I, I mean, I, my main question is: is where do you think, in terms of I guess starting work or continuing work for Volume Two, along with the Yezu and some other things? Where do we principally start in terms of a real driver project for some of this stuff? Yeah, this is really quick. I actually asked Lynn about the about the second music manual, and he wrote me back on it. He said, he said you got to begin to look at the, this uh, the first with what Harley said about the Ave Verum. And Boxing and principles, and then look at look at uh, the Pythagorean column to actually get a sense of like how bel canto is in, is in musical instruments. There yeah, was, and, and a lot of the boomers, or the, I mean, the, we, we didn't. Our, he said our organization hasn't hasn't really approached, hasn't really like gotten to that level yet. Like actually, understand. Well, look, I, I've discussed this with Lynn a number of occasions, and, and Lynn actually threw this out once when uh, Elizabeth Nash one time did one of her touchy-feely questions of 
how can we get along, Lynn, and how can we communicate, and we have all of these dissonances among us. And Lynn said, get Harley to do some work on the string quartets. Do the choral work, because what do you find? First of all, this is where the rigor comes in. On the bel canto vocal registration, when Jessica was here, this is what she was doing. Getting it so that everyone knows where to place the voice, how you place it, so that it becomes automatic. You know, most of us started singing. I mean, we, we may have done a little singing, maybe some choral music. But serious, rigorous singing, if you start in your 20s, it's very difficult. If music is a language in your childhood, the way it was for Mozart, so that you know solfege, you don't have to think, is that a do or a re? But it's just there. You've got to start with children's choruses so that we have a generation that actually thinks musically. It's, it's similar to the, why it's easier sometimes to have uh, a three-year-old learn two languages at home. You know, they're not sure. They're, they don't really know that they're two different languages. They can learn Spanish and English or French and German or something like that. But it's harder when you get older. But what it means is that we have to be rigorous with the bel canto registration. We have to work on it so that we know in a section that everyone will pass into the next register at exactly the same point. Now, Briano, this is one of the problems with Briano. He isn't that rigorous. Lynn insists that we have to be that rigorous. Now, once you get that, then you can start looking at the stringed instruments. And you can start, Lynn said, just as a, a starting point, each string is, you know, is like a different register. You have different sounds, like a G string. There's a richness to it. The D string, a little wimpier. But it still has a sound. And an A string... string. They're a fifth apart, but you have different sounds with each string. Now then you add a viola. A viola has a beautiful, rich tone. I mean, viola is one of the unfortunately unappreciated instruments, but it's an incredibly beautiful instrument. A cello, of course, you know, the cello has the same capability of producing a true deep tone. So you have these three instruments. And you have to start thinking, okay, first of all, you have the registration from one string, then you, from one string to the other, then you have between a violin and a viola, a violin and a cello, a viola and a cello. So you're dealing with a kind of multiplicity, polyphony, many voices, within each of the instruments and then between the three. So that's, what you're, that's where you start. Now, this... Mozart work on Bach is so beautiful because you're seeing something you rarely see. You see it in science. You see it, for example, with Cusa, going back to Archimedes and the quadrature of the circle, working on the same problem. You see it with the uh, work on uh, Sphericx, that the, the uh, pre-Socratic geometers are then picked up by Cusa, by Kepler. The, the problem that Gauss writes of in the fundamental theorem, going back to the Delian paradox, to try and demonstrate a principle in construction and why that's superior to anything you can do in a logical, formal, algebraic system. So that kind of communication between great minds across the centuries you see it in the physical sciences. The relationship, for example, as Bruce has demonstrated, between Kepler and Kepler's exploration of non-uniform motion in the elliptical orbits, leading directly to Leibniz solving the problem by developing the calculus. Now here we have, in this piece, in this set of this 405, Kerschel 405, Mozart taking Bach and communicating with the then dead Johann Sebastian Bach, and passing on to us his insights. I tried to show you a little of that tonight, but there's much, much more. That's why the work that Mihua is doing 
is so important. And we'll probably put together a Fidelio article on, as part of the, the 250th birthday of this principle of why Euclidean geometry and Fuchs's conception of counterpoint is for robots and computers, but not for humans. <coughs> so this is the kind of work you have to do. It's, it's difficult, it's painstaking, you've got to develop the whole language and expand the language. That's what, that's what Lynn has wanted us to do for 40 something years. And now we've got a whole new laboratory within which to work. So it's in your court. Yeah. Uh, so well, yeah. Yes, absolutely. The same key signature. Well, if you want to actually get the thinking, why, why would you change the keys or the modes? If you want to get the thinking of Bach, you'd have to work it through in his in the key that he used and the modal changes that he used. But you know, sometimes some instruments don't the keys don't absolutely correspond. So that's why sometimes you, you, with, you see with the clarinet the way they change the reed to make sure you get the proper note. That's why if you have a, an orchestra, a modern orchestra, playing Brahms, it's very difficult to keep the horns in, in tune. You know, the horns go all over the place. So the keys are not, sometimes there's a difference in the instrument. But Bach or Mozart used, he was rigorous with this, although Mihua's, uh, she's discovered some changes that Mozart made. And we're going to, when she gets back here, when I get back to Houston, we'll take a look at that. So stay tuned on that one, Joel. Um, let me, if there's one more question, I'll take it before I completely blow out my voice. All right, well, I hope this provided some basis for some more work and a, a lot of thought. Okay.